Yeah, I think we got there. Okay. Hi, so thank you to the Mark Hughes Foundation for the invitation and to everyone for attending. My name is Kat and as Ali said, I work in the neurosurgery and neurology ward at John Hunter Hospital. And my role is primarily inpatient support. Um, I do apologize ahead of time because I have a lot of information and I wanted to talk about it and it might not be relevant for everyone, but I hope that everyone can take, you know, a few bits and pieces home with them today. And I also have a table of resources just over in that back corner. So come and have a look later. And a lot of the things I'm talking about today, um, the resources are there. So I often find that my role is not so well understood in a hospital setting. Um, so I guess I wanted to firstly speak about um, my role, yeah, just in the middle, um, speak about my role and the support that a social worker can provide. Um, social workers exist both for people admitted in hospital, but also for carers, <laughs> um, yeah, so social workers is ex exist for people admitted in hospital, um, but also for carers and families. Um, we also have, um, we also offer support for people in outpatient settings. Um, I work in a team of many at the John Hunter Hospital, um, and we're primarily inpatient social workers, but I also have um, colleagues over at the Calvary Mater who work with um, inpatients and outpatients. And if you're receiving treatment over at the MARTA, that's generally the teams that you would be working with. Um, so at a core, social workers provide both emotional, practical and advocacy support. Um, everyone has access to a social worker, you, no, but no one is obliged to see us. It's really your choice. Um, discovery of a brain tumour is an enormous shock and an absolute roller coaster of uncertainty. You know, anxiety and worry is just so normal and natural, and it's very inherent within a cancer diagnosis. Um, so, social workers, we support with grief, challenges for the family, um, how to tell the kids, changes in independence, those identity changes, and financial stress. I do often find that patients and families you know, want to take it each day as it comes. And that's a great way of dealing with it. But then um, I've got other patients who want to talk about everything right now. What am I doing with employment? What am I doing with my finances, housing, all of it? So everyone deals with it very differently. Um, no, okay, doesn't matter. Um, so... The first service, so with increases in funding locally um, and more emphasis being placed on um, brain cancer, there are some services I wanted to talk about today. Um, so the first service I wanted to discuss is the Hunter Cancer Hub, which we've got a little stall here, so everyone please come and have a chat with them um, if that's going to be useful for you. Um, that they're based at Katara Homemaker Centre and it's the permanent location for canteen and camp quality, which are the services that are available for individuals up to 25 years old. Um, but they also offer support for parents, um, sorry, for children of parents with cancer. And once a month they hold a, like, a service day where a variety of services will come to that one location and you can ask lots of questions and sort of get the particular support from each of those services. So the second service I wanted to talk about today is the National Advocacy Service. Some of you might have had some involvement with them. Um, it's a great service that was introduced in November last year and it's solely to support people with a primary diagnosis of brain cancer. Um, so this service has three workers and they're based in Queensland and in Victoria and some of them have a personal experience with brain cancer. So they're really approachable and they have a good insight into what everyone is going through. Um, their role is to support people with NDIS, Centrelink, 
my aged care and other non-gov services and they can really support you to navigate those processes because we all know that it's pretty hard to get through them. Um, and I've had really positive experiences with them and I know that Elise has had really great experiences as well. So um, I have a resource over at my table and it's called the Survivorship Diary. So some of you might have received that when you got your brain cancer pack from Elise and the girls. Um, it's a free resource to people who have brain cancer and it's to support with managing the treatment and lifestyle after a diagnosis. It's got various chapters on, it's got you know like a seizure diary, it's got where you can put all the professionals that you're involved with, so your neurosurgeon, um, you know, your oncologist. So you can put all that information in there. Um, so that's, yeah. So now I just wanted to talk about um, financial assistance. So with the impact of brain cancer on your cognition and your physical function, there can be a big financial stress for you and your whole family. Once you move past that state of shock, you start questioning about how life is gonna go on, and what do I need to do? Um, so the first support, which again, might not be relevant for everyone, um, is something called the ITTA scheme. It's like an isolated patient accommodation scheme. And that's for people who have to travel over 100 kilometers to, from their specialist appointment. So for the rural girls, that's you know something that they're all getting because it's really hard. It's a big, big financial cost. Um, so with IPTAS, it's a reimbursement for a transport and accommodation. So say you live in Port Macquarie and you're having to come to the John, then you're, you can re get reimbursement for that accommodation and for that transport. Um, and you can do a Google search or come and have a chat with me later. So with our Cancer Council, they do an amazing financial assistance program. Um, this is, a, if you're eligible for it, it's a one-off payment of $350 and it's for a bill or you can get vouchers for um, Coles or Woolies. And they also, and it's primarily for like groceries and whatnot, but they also do a separate payment of 350 for home help. So that could be gardening and cleaning. Um, and Cancer Council also have a financial counselling support, which can be really useful as well. Um, in my daily role at the John, I'm always encouraging people to look at options around daycare, the school, the bank, because there's often considerations to um, reduce costs there, just for compassionate grounds. So um, if everyone wants to put their hands up if they've had anything to do with Centrelink. Yes, okay. And I guess keep your hand up if you've had difficulties with them and your experience hasn't been great. Yeah, yeah, that's my day to day. So. Most people I talk to, sadly, have had a really negative experience with Centrelink. Um, so really, it's the social worker's job, you know, at the John, at the MARTA, and also that service I mentioned earlier, the National Advocacy Service. It's our job to support that process and to try and make that a little bit easier for you guys. Um, there's quite a lot to discuss about Centrelink. The payments are all on Services Australia website. Um, I guess the payments that I most commonly support patients to access is, first of all, a job seeker payment. So this is a great payment that you can access as an interim while you're waiting to get onto the disability support pension. But essentially, it's just a payment that um, is if you can't work for a short period of time. So you have a job you're in hospital, you're in and out, you're having sick leave, but you've used that up and you need some level of income coming in. So definitely apply for that job seeker payment. Um, the, and it's a two week turnaround after your payment's been granted. It's the quickest one of them all. And I really encourage people to apply for that one if they haven't. Um, 
look for the disability support pension. Um, this is a payment for if your condition is going to last for more than two years. Um, you need medical evidence from your doctor stating that. And I often recommend um, when applying to Centrelink, just provide the worst case scenario. So look on when I'm not feeling the, like on the worst day, that's what you need to list it as. Don't put it on, we all have our best days, but go off your worst day. Um, the challenge with this payment is that your condition needs to be treated, stabilised and stop you from working for 15 weeks. So that can be just a really big barrier for people with brain cancer who are actively seeking treatment and Centrelink are questioning that and not understanding the bigger picture of what brain cancer looks like. Um, within the disability support pension, there is a terminal illness DSP, and that is for someone who has an average life expectancy of less than two years. And I say that as average life expectancy, so it doesn't mean that you will um, pass away in that time, but the average life expectancy of that diagnosis. And that payment is very quick turnaround. Elise and I have had amazing, I think, pretty good responses with how speedy that's come through. Um, for our carers in the room, um, obviously we've got, if anyone is not on a carer's payment or is on a carer's payment, um, this is income support for people who are providing full-time care. Um, it's, it is means tested, however, depending on your income, you can work up to 25 hours and you just need to speak to your medical professional or have a chat with the cancer um, coordinators. The other one is a carer's allowance, and it's a payment to carers to assist with the cost of caring on top of your usual cost of living. It's not means tested though, so that's a great allowance to have if you're already working full time, apply for that allowance, and then, you know, it's not a significant um, benefit, but it is something and it's just to pay for those costs. And then with that carer's allowance, there's a carer's supplement that you get, and it's $600 and it's paid every July. Um, so again, it's a little bit extra just to help. So just some advice around Centrelink. Um, Centrelink backdates from the time when you register your intent to claim. So you can do that by calling them up or going on the Centrelink app and just registering your intent to claim. You don't need to start the the ball rolling, but just start it, and then they're going to backdate to that date. So that's really handy. Um, on applying, applying online for a Centrelink benefit can be really helpful because um, you can see the progress of your application. And if you've put something in and it comes back as um, needing more evidence, you can see that straight away. You don't have to wait a few weeks for someone to call you to say, hey, you haven't submitted this bank statement. Um, if anyone's ever stuck, go into the Centrelink office. I think people call, and obviously we're all on the phone for waiting for two hours for that, but depending on the office, I can't speak in regard to other offices, but the Charlestown office does have a lot of staff on site and they will help you with the application or with the process. Um, and... The other thing is just it really helps to have supporting letters from your specialist, your social worker, your cancer co care coordinator um, about your diagnosis and your prognosis. So I wanted to talk about superannuation. Um, I've got a really detailed handout over at the table because it's not going to be relevant for everyone. Um, but there are different um, reasons that you can seek early access of your super and Sometimes you apply directly to the ATO and sometimes you apply directly to the super company. Um, for some of the requests, you require two doctors to sign off on that. But look, come and talk to me about it if that's something that's relevant for you. So, um, again, got more information over at the table, but I wanted to talk about home care services. So... This is a service that most people probably don't know about. Um, 
It's provided by New South Wales Health and there's a small cost of about $10 a week. So the first service is something called Compax. So Compax is only accessible from like LHD, so public hospitals. Um, it's a six week service to support discharges. So it's only for inpatients and it can assist with cleaning, shopping, transport, meals, showering. So that's just an inpatient service. But the next service is something called Safe and Supported at Home. It's called SASH, if anyone's familiar with that term. Um, this is a service that you can actually access from the community. So you don't have to be an inpatient to get it. And it's for 18 to 64 year olds. And all you need is an NDIS reference number. So you get a reference number by ringing up and saying that you're interested in accessing the NDIS and you get the, if you're eligible and you get the like reference number. So that's all you need for this. Or you can be in the process of applying for NDIS, had your application rejected. So for anyone who's gone through that and it's been rejected, you're eligible for this. And also in the process of appealing the NDIS. Um, you can be referred by your GP, you can be referred by the girls here, you can be referred by Calvary Mata. So that's a really good support um, for that gap. And then the last package is our palliative care package. Um, and this is for people who um, are experiencing functional decline or the terminal phase of their illness. So that's you know less than three months to live. There's no age limit to that package. There's not even really a time frame, so it's not a six week package. It's just sort of pretty, it could be three months. Um, and again, same referral, GP, clinicians here, social workers. Cool. So now we can talk about the NDIS. Um, I'm going to assume, maybe poorly, I don't know, um, that some of you have struggled quite a lot with the NDIS. And we know that's really common for people with brain cancer. Um, I wish I had a lot more time to talk about the NDIS today, but we actually do have a store holder over there today. So that's a great spot for you to go and talk to them. Um, look, in a simplistic nature, the NDIS was created to support anyone under the age of 65 living with a permanent and significant disability. Um, supports available through NDIS are personal care, um, home, like other home care services, um, community access, mobility aids, home mods and equipment. It's useful to have a health professional assist you with this application. So as I mentioned, that national advocacy service, because they can help you navigate the complexities um, of this agency. We have had a lot of success since changing our terminology in these applications um, and altering what we state as the primary diagnosis. So, for example, we say acquired brain injury secondary to brain cancer and you specify which type. Um, and, oh, okay, so then now I just wanted to talk about my age care. Um, so this is home care that is for people above the age of 65 or for people over the age of 50 if you identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Um, same situation as NDIS, you can give My Age Care, my age care a call, but in, just ensure if you're a family member calling on behalf of um, your family member, um, call with them because they need to actually speak with the person who's desiring to access the service. So there's two types of home care available through My Age Care. One is the Commonwealth Home Support Program. Some of you might be familiar with this. This is single services that you're approved for. So for example, you could have um, approval for like domestic and transport assistance, but that's all that you need. Um, the opposite or the next um, type of home care is something called a home care package and this is coordinated support um, and you need something called an ACAT assessment 
There's different levels to this home care package. So one being the lowest level of care and four being the highest level. Um, for example, a level four is only a max of 12 to 14 hours of care a week. So it's not going to support you, you know, what's that? 1.5 to two hours um, a day. So if you're needing more help than that, it's, you know, it does what it does really. Um, so once you're approved for home care, then you can choose the service provider that you want. Um, again, more information over at um, the table. I just wanted to briefly talk about residential respite. Um, so residential respite is care in a nursing home temporarily. Um, you can go into respite for a variety of reasons. So one be if your family's going away and you're unable to care for yourself. Um, if your primary carer becomes unwell or they're hospitalised, um, if you think that you want to move into a nursing home but you're not sure, so it's, I don't like saying try before you buy, but that sort of is it. Um, or if you injure yourself, so break your leg, family can't help you, so you just go in there for a short time. Um, it's a set cost, so it's not means tested, so regardless of if you're self-funded retiree or on the pension, it's the same cost. And you're entitled to 63 days a year for respite. And also, some people aren't aware of this, it can be extended by 21 days. So you've got your 63 and you can extend it by your 21 and it can continue to be extended under certain circumstances. Cool. Um, just summing quickly, it's not very helpful because you can't see it on the slide, but um, with NDIS, My Age Care and Centrelink, all of these agencies require signatures and consent from you and your family to communicate on someone's behalf. So I have a few consent forms over there because this is my biggest bugbear in the hospital is that obviously I'm calling on behalf of someone trying to access the support, but then I have to go through the process of getting the consent, even though they're with me. It's very confusing, but anyway. Um, so yeah, come and have a talk to me about those if you need them. Um, look, it's essential to plan ahead. Um, regardless of your situation, most people don't consider enduring guardian, enduring power of attorney, will, you know, they don't consider it until you need to consider it. And it just adds so much stress to an already extremely stressful time. Um, with these documents, you have to complete them either with a solicitor or a doctor, and you have to have what's called mental capacity. So that means that you're understanding what you're um, signing. So you're understanding the pros and the cons of that decision. Um, enduring guardian only comes into effect when you're incapable of making decisions for yourself. And it's solely for medical, dental, accommodation and services. The other one is power of attorney. Um, so you've got normal power of attorney or an enduring power of attorney. And this is solely just for financial decision making. Um, and a power of attorney, a normal power of attorney, becomes invalid when you lose capacity. Um, whereas an enduring power of attorney continues to have effect after that. And both of these become invalid on death. Um, it's important to that we all have a will. Um, a will is a document that states your wishes after death. There can be quite a delay with the trustee and guardian if you were to pass away and your assets were, and you don't didn't have a will which you know, desired where you want those to go. Um, so, you know, it can be useful, useful to have in place. And then lastly, I just want to talk about an advanced care directive. So that's a document that's completed by a medical professional with your family. You can download this online um, and this document will go through your wishes for your health care and the measures that you would want taken under certain circumstances. So whether that's breathing support, CPR. So it's a useful document to have. Um, so with most of those documents, you can just speak to your solicitor about it. Cancer Council have a great service to be able to access if you're eligible for it. 
or you can just go into the local court and request a registrar of the New South Wales court to sign it. You just need to make an appointment or you can call the New South Wales trustee and guardian. Cool. So um, just briefly, I'm sure the girls can talk to you more about this because we've got Cancer Council here at the moment. Um, but the pro bono program through Cancer Council is free if you're eligible. And there's, these are services that are run by professionals in the community who volunteer their time. So there's a legal referral service, a financial planning referral service, a workplace referral service, and a small business referral service. And obviously the legal would be your wills, power of attorney, super, employment law. Um, it doesn't do family law though, just in case. Um, with the financial planning referral service, um, this is, they can give you support with accessing Centrelink, transitioning to retirement. The um, workplace referral service is like HR professionals. So they can support you with employment issues during, after treatment. They can also help people with returning to work. If there's any discrimination issues that you're experiencing, they're a really great support to get. Um, disclosure of a cancer diagnosis to your workplace and confidentiality around that. Um, they also, if you're returning back into work or you've had a period of time where you're not working, they can explain, help you explain the resume gap due to that treatment. And they can also help with resume and interview techniques. So that's a nice service to be able to have if you're eligible for it. Um, and then the last one is the small business service and they do like bookkeeping, buzz statements, um, preparing a business for sale and wind up. Cool. So as Mark mentioned earlier, carers, they are the glue. Um, they hold everything together and they do a lot, you know, with the transport to appointments, the practical and emotional support, looking out for, um, you know, the informal and the formal supports to try and get um, you to manage. That can all be really challenging. And they often, you know, within that, you need to prioritise your own self-care. And sometimes when you don't feel like you're the priority because of something that's going on with your family member, you, it's, it's hard. And um, just so you know, you know, your loved ones are in such a better um, position with you by your side. You, yeah, by their side. Um, so something I wanted to talk about was Carer Gateway. So Carer Gateway is a great service for carers and provides both practical and emotional support for carers. I've got information over again at the table um, and on the slide you can, it has the number that you can call. They do emergency respite. And it's available, that number is 24-7. So if you're in the middle of the night and you need someone to come and support, you can give that number a call. Um, so that's me done. Sorry that my slide didn't work. I don't know what happened there. Anyway, um, yeah. Cool.